villain goes ahead and bets 2x pot after some thought, and if you actually imagine the range this player reaches the river with, it's drowning in combos like jack-10, queen-jack, all of which we unblock. Ladies and gents, welcome to another instructional yet highly entertaining I hope cash game video here at Carrot Corner. This is called how to play like an utter maniac and pull it off. Today I'm going to be showing you up to 73 hands that I've just played at 200 zoom. We may not get through all of them, but I'm optimistic. The pace is going to be fast, the play is going to be crazy, because in this session I intentionally adopted the good old loose aggressive lag style of play. There are three elements to effectively playing this kind of wild strategy and getting away with it, and they are as follows. Firstly, you want to capitalise on an abundance of fold equity wherever possible, and you're going to see me doing that to devastating effect in this session. Secondly, you want to enter some hands you wouldn't normally. These could be spots that are break even in theory or even slightly losing, but due to your skill edge and overwhelmingly massive ego, you think you can play these spots profitably. Thirdly, you want to make people suffer. You want all of their decisions to be torturous, and you want to impose yourself as the massive bully of the table taking advantage of everybody's fear and discomfort. If you're ready to learn how to play more hands and make more money in the process, then let's go. Queen seven of diamonds now, we open the button and pick up a call from the big blind. Queen 10 three is definitely a board on which we can range bet. Villain makes the call and onto the six of hearts turn. As this is a spot where my range is gonna be playing over bets only as my soul sizing, I elect to check back. On the jack of diamonds river, our hand does qualify for a thin value bet. Villain checked very quickly here. This is the sort of spot I would overbluff furiously if I had air, meaning I would bluff way more combos than game theory would suggest, and I'd bluff further up into my showdown value region. The reason I do this against a snap check is it's very difficult to snap check the nuts here when you're going for a slow play, and the less combos of the nuts are in villain's range compared to how many are meant to be there, the better it is for us to both value bet thinly and overbluff. We decide to bet 75% pot, villain calls with exactly the same hand in a different suit and we chop it up. A6 of hearts here in the small blind and we decide to peel. This is a good example of coming along in a spot that would be dicey in theory, but because two of these opponents were actually recreational players, we just fancy our chances here. We decide to bet small on the turn here. This is a very good exploitative play. When you have two recreational players here, both of whom had a free betting opportunity, because cutoff was this would be C better, and button was checked to by both opponents, and they both check, they're going to have way less straight draws, flush draws, and top pair plus in their range than they should in theory. Theoretical checking ranges are meant to be sort of protected in spots like this, and given that people are betting too often with all sorts of hands earlier on, their checking ranges are sitting ducks with this sort of very cheap price aggression from us, I really like this play. 8-7 now in the hijack, we go for an open and pick up a call from the big blind. This hand is absolutely sick. We decide to check back here, and the jack of diamonds falls on the turn. At this point in the hand, villain leads, and we know this is a weaker player, and if there's one thing I can say about this spot in game theory is that it's pretty horrible for the big blind's range, and what that means is that very few hands are actually allowed to do this. For villain to bet 60% pot there, they're going to need to have a decent ace plus for value, and then be quite selective about what they bluff. A naked gutter, something like, for example, queen 10 in this spot, is not going to get to do this at a high frequency, especially without a spade or a diamond. Therefore, I think that probably the fish population here is over bluffing, and also they're quite likely just to be betting randomly sometimes with, with hands that they shouldn't, so I think this is a fairly easy call. The Ace of Diamonds is a bittersweet river, it does decrease the number of combos of boats and Ace X in our opponent's range, and when we face a bet that we only need about 26% equity to call, tells us there, but I knew that guys, I did, I knew it, I knew it, honest, um, then we have to basically call again here. This is a card that's going to reduce a lot of villains value bets, and I just think it's almost impossible that we don't win far more than 26% of the time. If you asked me how often do we win in this spot, I would venture a guess that we actually run into a worse hand than ours when we call upwards of 40-45% of the time. So absolutely um, snap call territory and we do catch the bluff this time, happy days. Or now in the cutoff, we make another loosey-goosey peel because this table is soft. We have a weaker player on the button and in the hijack and because we're very self self-indulgent and overly confident, we're just going to say, hey, I've got plus EV here, whatever I do, I can close my eyes and not even look at the flop and I can still beat these guys. 
The fog comes Jack 8-7, which is terrible. Villains should just be checking range here. This is an absurd bet to build into your strategy in terms of GTO, but they do it anyway, and we just have a fold. Just because their play is bad doesn't mean we can do anything about it with the fours, right? Jack 9, go for a defend this time, but we could have gone for a, a raise here sometimes, a 3-bet pre. Decide to lead this flop. I think when there's three what I call danger zone cards, that's cards between eight and uh, a three that are all connected in this situation. Maybe not so much the three usually, but when it's connected to the seven and the six, it's a kind of danger zone card for villain's range because it increases the EV of 4x, 5x, pocket 4s, pocket 5, 6, 5, 6, 4, etc, etc, right? So building a leading range on these boards that massively favor the big blind player, where the button is going to have to check back a lot, is a nice thing to do. We lead one third pot and villain calls. On the seven of spades turn, we consider bluffing here, but we decide to check this time. I don't think bluffing is totally out of the question, but once we get a turn that's not so great for range that eats up some of our value combos and just makes villains over pairs more invincible, I think we need to be a little bit more selective. The river seems like a pretty optional bluff spot. I don't think it's bad to bluff here, but I also don't think it's a great thing to do. I think if villain is peeling too many over cards on the flop, this is a no brainer bluff, but otherwise I don't think people actually find enough folds here with the pair region after this action sequence. So I decide to check and villain shows me a hand that they should never show down. This is a huge blunder by my opponent to show down King nine. They are basically gonna be winning very infrequently here and doing really well by betting in a spot where their range becomes stronger than ours. So king high here, not that you should ever call flop with this hand I don't think, but if you did, you should be turning this sort of hand into a bluff. Okay, queen seven, we go for an open on the button and we pick up a call from the big blind. Queen four four is a board on which you can go either way with top pair, it doesn't really matter. We decide to bet this time, opting for the small sizing because the flop is paired and that just eats away our nut advantage a little bit. Nut advantage guys is the factor that determines bet sizing. The thing about it. Snowman's again in the hijack, open and pick up a call, 3-4-5 on the flop and it goes check check. This is a board I'm actually checking back ridiculously often, just not looking to do much investing in a spot where it favours my opponent's range so much. Villain leads the turn and we have a pretty easy call here, raising isn't totally ridiculous but I think we want a slightly bigger pocket pair to start value raising and then on the river just a no brainer, a spot where villains should only be bluffing about 15% of the time is going to end up over bluffing all day long as well as merging some random hands that we beat like 5x, 6s and 7s. Easy call, this time he has a 3, nice hand and we lose a small pot. This is a pretty standard call against men in position blind versus blind, you need to be playing almost anything but the most hopeless hands imaginable. 10-6 is what I'd call semi-trash, it's really bad, but it's not quite bad enough to fold. We make the call here and the flop comes Jack-5-4, villain checks and this is a very classic exploitative spot. What's happening here is that in game theory terms, villains should be playing what we call a mixed polarized strategy. That's to say they should be checking and mixing their really good hands here between bet and check raise. If villain has kings, kings is meant to land in this check in range something like half the time. This doesn't happen, nor does it happen with flush draws, sets, top pair decent kicker or any of these hands. Even hands like pocket 10s probably get bet by a recreational player here more often than they should. What this means is that the checking range is massively going to be filled with things like ace queen, ace king, king queen, etc, air hands and just basically some showdown value but not much going on so we can just start firing here. I go for about 60% pot and villain calls and on the ace turn I plan on betting again on this card sometimes but villain decides to dunk pot and I fold. Queen 6 of clubs now in the hijack, another loosey goosey open but again I'm favouring my EV on these tables and I don't think this is terrible. Villain calls big blind and another one calls in the on the button. Queen 9 8 and we start off with a small bet on the snowed. The villain on the button calls. I want you to track this player's range. What they've done so far is they've peeled preflop from the button, which is already going to condense their range considerably, and now they've continued on queen 9 8. Their range here is going to be things like slow plays occasionally, such as sets 8 9 jack 10, but for the most part, these hands will raise on this node, especially with the flush draw present. This tends to be how recreational players approach the spot. There'll be a lot of queen x, there'll be maybe some combos of two pair, and there will also be some drawing hands. This player in the big blind also comes along and I think we have a very easy turn check here. On the seven of hearts, it's not really clear to me why we would be betting. I guess we could block bet for very thin value given that our redraw boosts our equity a little bit, but I think checking and avoid just villain jamming on me on the button is much better. Villain checks back and we head over to the four of diamonds river. I decide to check again as value betting feels way too thin here and this player now bets half pot. 
I think it's quite clear that our hand is a bluff catcher. This player could have just checked back with a 9 or an 8, and given that no one else has got the chance to act here, it seems overwhelmingly likely that they would have chosen to do that. Therefore, their value bets now beat us, and the only thing we're beating is bluffs. Villain's bluffs in this node are pretty few and far between, while you can imagine some combos like the King Jack or King Ten of Clubs here. We do block the A6 of Clubs and the King Six of Clubs if Villain was getting really loose preflop, and so I don't actually think there's enough that we beat to call needing 24% equity. I think we're mainly just going to run into better Queen X, two pair, and hands of this nature with the occasional slow played monster, and I think this is actually just a good exploitative fold. If the board had been different and there were more missed draws or it wasn't multi-way or something or villain was in the big blind and not the button cold caller, all of these things could have swayed us towards calling. Ace-Queen offsuit in the big blind if we peel this open. This is a board that's actually better for us when it's rainbow. This is a great rank of board but when there's a bunch of low cards that are all monotone, what's going to happen is that under the guns range is maybe going to be richer in flushes than ours. This is because they have more big cards in their range as a percentage of their range and they're also going to just have way more big hybrid hands such as pocket pair plus club. So I don't think this is really the same sort of thing where we want to build a leading range as it was on the 763 rainbow. What monotone boards tend to do is neutralize the advantage that the rank of the board gives one player or the other. We go ahead and check here, Bill and checks back. On the turn this is a key exploit spot to check in. The idea is that villain's range is going to be massively underprotected. Club combos and pair plus club and as well as pocket pairs and sets are supposed to have the same EV by betting flop on this node as they do by checking. What this means is that when our opponent checks behind their range is going to be massively weighted towards hands that cannot call a bet and therefore trying to maximize your EV against the bottom of villain's range which is basically most of their range is going to be the best plan. We opt for a check in the hope that we can garner extra EV from hands like Queen Jack of Hearts, King Queen of Diamonds, Ace Queen Offsuit No Club and all of this stuff. The river comes to 10 of spades and this does make my opponent some one pair. Therefore it's a little bit tempting to actually start value betting now. Another reason that I decided to stop bluff catching on this node and make this bet was that Villain snap checked the turn. If Villain had thought a little bit it could be more indicative that they're considering betting but when someone is in just snap check don't like it gonna check down mode I think it's better just to go ahead and bet here. That said Villain's range does still contain a lot of fairly terrible hands and I don't think checking again is a bad idea at all. If the river had been something like a deuce, I think it's almost impossible to get called by weaker hands given how weak the opponent's range will be in practice and therefore checking is going to be the best line. The 10 is interesting and on a card like a jack or a king I'm just way more inclined to bet because much of villain's air is going to connect and make a bluff catcher rather than a hand that's going to bluff. Queen jack off in the big blind now and the button opens to 2.5x we go ahead and peel and the flop comes jack 8 deuce. I don't think it's ridiculous to raise this hand sometimes, in fact it's fine if you're using a smaller sizing, but we decide to call. Turn comes the four of spades, we check again and villain checks back. The queen on the river is interesting, on the one hand we do unblock hands like an 8 here, pocket 9s, pocket 10s, certain bluff catchers. On the other hand our range is pretty strong on this node and we do unblock all air combos. I think betting big and checking are both completely okay here. I'm not sure about betting small, I think the problem is that we block a lot of the worst hands that would raise us, like Queen X, and therefore it might just be good to go for a big bet or a check. This time I decide to check, obviously with the intention of check raising, but unfortunately my opponent checks back. Usually in game theory we have this rule that if you can check raise you don't have to bet, but that's dependent on your blockers. In this spot our blockers are definitely okay, I think for check raising, but I think big betting is also okay. Queen 10 of clubs under the gun and we open, picking up a call this time from the button. 365 comes and we start with a check. Villain bets big and while we could maybe check raise here, this is a really horrible board for range and I'm just going to favour slightly better pair draws that have two over cards to things like 9s and 10s. Queen 10 doesn't have two over cards to 10s, I think we can do a bit better here with our bluff selection but I don't think raising is horrible, especially if villain is too wide pre or betting too often. Snowman's for the third time of the session and we call in the big blind. It goes check check here and on the jack of spades turn we check again. Against a tiny bet, again it's good that we have these two suits because both our remaining eights don't hit flushes when they come and we do have some showdown value. I think this hand definitely has to at least mix call here in these positions so we do call but we're pretty much bottom of range on the king of clubs river and an easy pitch. Queen ten of spades we go for three bets, we're playing loosey goosey and go for a check on the swap. 
This is a board that's not quite as good as you would think because Ace Queen and stuff with a Queen in it in general is the more common type of Broadway hand in our opponent's flathing range to our 3-bet. Therefore, I think building a checking range on this board is fine and this hand makes an ideal candidate to go into it all of the time. Villain checks back, the 5 of diamonds comes on the turn and we check again. What I would do in this spot is decide which sizing my range would use and build my strategy from there. As I'm mainly interested in betting hands like Ace King, Ace Jack, Ace 10 plus, two pair sets, etc. I'm going to build a large bet for a slight overbet or maybe just like 80-90% pots, something like that. Queen 10 very comfortably in that paradigm is a check. I don't even think this hand would be a great bet if we were using a smaller sizing in our toolkit here. Three of hearts comes on the river and we have a few options. I think villain's range at this point is massively weighted towards eight, sevens, nines and tens. Some of these will have a heart and might consider doing something silly if I block bet here. I don't even mind the idea of just like block calling in this spot honestly against an unknown because people are so bad at making their checking range on the turn strong enough. The biggest exploitative theme that I could really stress to you guys is that when people check where they didn't have to, they will not have as many strong hands as a solver would. So we go for this tiny block bet, the advantage being we may cause Villain to do something silly. I do plan on calling here because people just don't have enough good hands. And secondly, if Villain calls here, it's very possible we just get looked up by a ton of combos of like under pair plus heart. I think we have to make this block bet very small because if we go too large we run the risk of starting to isolate ourselves against a range that's too heavy in queen x that beats us and ace x that beats us sort of combos H jack of diamonds now under the gun pick up a call from the big blind and i'm playing a big bet strategy on this board again these two tone textures are situations where our opponent's range will be a bit more mergy containing combos of second pair third pair top pair weak kicker open end straight draw flush draw gutter etc Therefore, going for larger bets when your opponent has quite a mergy range is generally going to be a solid idea in GTO. We go for the big bet here, billing calls, and on the Queen of Spades turn, we check back. On the Five of Diamonds River, I think we just about qualify for a value bet here. Again, this will depend on how good people are at slow playing, as I have the read that people aren't great at checking a queen on the river here, even though they are supposed to check certain queen X, I think we can go ahead and bet. Another good example of a hand that villain is meant to check back on the river here would be something like nines. What nines does is blocks a hand that we could bluff catch with and unblocks lots of our bets. Anyway, villain folds, so none of that comes into play, but it's worth thinking about. 7 9, we open cutoff, loosey goosey, called by a big blind, and an easy check. This hand is absolutely fascinating as well. I really like this hand. I think this is one of these swaps where old school hand reading just comes back into the picture and you can start to think about what's more likely going on in your opponent's range construction here. So Villain decides to check the flop and we check back and on the eight of spades turn, they go for two X pop. What Villain's essentially saying here is I have a boat or I have an eight. This is the only sort of value hand that can ever pick this sizing. You'll note that our cards are phenomenally good at blocking 8x and boats. So this hand is a really easy continue. I might want to take a few seconds here just for the sake of it, but it's basically a snap call because we have almost the best blockers possible. And I think a hand like a 9 is going to make a way higher EV call against this particular sizing than something like pocket 10s. While pocket 10s is going to block the hell out of villain's bluffing range, the 9 is going to do the opposite, unblocking bluffs and blocking value bets. Always think about what your opponent is representing when you see unusually large bets, because that will make your blocker effects even more important than usual. We go for a call, the river comes to 5 of clubs, not really completing too many hands other than 6-7, which we now block. The 7 seems like way more of a positive blocker than a negative one here, given that it's only really blocking 10-7 as a bluff, but it's blocking both 8-7 and 6-7 for value here. Villain goes ahead and bets 2x pot after some thought, and if you actually imagine the range this player reaches the river with, it's drowning in combos like Jack-10, Queen-Jack, all of which we unblock. If Villain isn't careful here, this is an incredibly easy spot to overbluff, especially if you also have some non-standard bluffs on the flop. The value combos that we lose to, okay, 8x, sure, something like Jack-8 of diamonds, Queen-8 of clubs, Something like this, we block some of them, 6-7 we block some of them, 9's full, or 9-8 we block all of it, not all of it, but lots of it. So this looks like the hand to call with, but exploitatively I actually expect this spot to be over bluffed. Villain has the 10-6 of spades, I'm not sure about this one. There are no blockers to 8x because the 8 of spades is on the board and we don't have 10-8 offsuit in this spot. And secondly, Villain's going to block some folds like the A-6 of spades, King-6 of spades, 
Ace 10 of spades, King 10 of spades, Queen 10 of spades. I feel like the busted flush draws here should just by and large give up and over bet should just be the other suits that block trips and don't block my folding range so hard. Overall, an interesting one and we scoop a very delicious pot. Jax, we decide to three bet. Villain four bets. This spot sucks. I suspected this was a recreational player. Someone that throws in two green chips on their own is usually a recreational player, right? Because regs make it, you know, 23.719464 big blinds. Whereas this guy isn't doing that. So he's probably a recreational. And we decide to flat the four bet. I don't think there's another play. I think folding is slightly too weak in GTO here, but it wouldn't be awful. Much closer to a fold than a jam. And on 1098, a fantastic board for a range. I think we could build some leads. However, I expect people to see bet too much in general here, and so we just check. Villain jams. We need 37%. The thing is, if Villain has a hand like Kings with a spade, we actually have that. So the only way that we should fold here is if Villain is basically going to have a set a decent amount of the time or is just never going to be doing this with anything that we beat. But I wouldn't be shocked if like the Ace Jack of Clubs did this or the King Jack of Clubs did this or maybe even something like Ace 10 sometimes just losing its mind. I don't know. The sizing, the line, it's definitely a recreational player. There'll be volatility here. If I had to estimate our equity, I would think it's like 40 to 45% and I think this is just therefore going to be a no-brainer get in. Not super happy but one of these spots where the pot odds just justify it and um, we do end up losing the kings with a spade but we're about 39% against this hand the, the little equity thing popped up there. Ace queen call this is just a call I think you can do some raising with ace queen with a club probably if my GTO brain is working I think that's about where it is but who knows check check and i think here when you think about our range we're actually pretty far down the thing is that the eight of clubs massively improves like so many combos like all of our jack nine and club draws and nine six just became nutted and villain is checked back i therefore think that ace queen offsuit is actually very far down our range the only hands i can think of that are worse than this are queen nine and ace jack so I think we probably have to bluff this hand. What I do when I'm in a spot where I have to bluff and I have multiple sizes going on, because I have some over bets and big bets and some block bets here, is I just roll the RNG. And at this point in time, the RNG decided to roll a medium number, which meant I would bluff this sizing. This is the sort of sizing that correlates with sets, two pair, good king X with club blocker and that sort of thing within my range, fill and folds, and we win a nice spot. 7-9 offsuit, how on earth do we end up playing this one? Well, blind versus blind. Give me position, give me a player I think I can beat up, give me a inflated ego I'm gonna call, right? I'm gonna do it. We make the call, queen eight seven comes, and villain bets one big blind. Okay, let's call. The nine comes on the turn and villain bets pot. Okay, let's call. The river is the ace of diamonds and villain quickly jams. This bot sucks. Our hand is basically a bluff catcher at this point, although it's not impossible that Villain could have a hand like Ace-King or something like this and just be slightly overplaying it. We do lose to almost all two pair and 8-7 suited is only two combos. I think it's fair to say that if this hand is what I call a value beater in my school, a hand that chops or wins against the one combo or more value bets in the opponent's range, then it still might not be a call, even if it beats a couple of value combos, because I think this spot is clinically underbluffed. I really don't think that a recreational player that had fairly passive looking stats is going to go ahead and jam pot here very often with air, although it can happen at the low SBR. Queen 10 of spades now. Go ahead and defend big blind. Queen 10, seven, villain bit small, and we make the raise. Villain folds. What's this raise all about? Well, the idea here is that because villain is again range betting, this hand is actually much stronger than it looks in such a wide range configuration. With the back door, we're a bit more inclined to raise because we can actually suck out on hands that beat us sometimes and garner more implied odds in a massive pot. I think this raise is totally cool, as is call, and you just want to be mixing your play here. I hope you enjoyed this video guys and just to remind you it's now only going to be a few weeks until the Carrot Poker School the video course is available for sale on CarrotCorner.com. If you're watching this from July 2022 onwards head over there and grab the most academic university style poker course that's ever seen the light of day. In the meantime I'll see you for more videos every Friday here on the Carrot Corner Poker Education YouTube channel. Let us know what you think about the content please do smash that like button and write something below and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye for now.